Good morning, good afternoon. I don't know if it's good evening anywhere uh, for any of you, but uh, thank you, Gannat, and all those who are attending from near and far away. I recognize a few names, uh, many of them I do not know, so um, good to make your acquaintance. Um, I've listened to a few of the conversations, uh, tuned in kind of a little bit late to Donna's and um, of course, Norio's. Uh, and so there's a lot to talk about and a lot to share. Uh, really very special topic for me. And I wanted to kind of give you all a background piece uh, since I noticed that many of you are um, unfamiliar to me and I expect uh, I am unfamiliar to you. So I want to talk a little bit about kind of where I came from and how I came to macrobiotics as well as came into this whole world of end of life care and death and dying. Uh, when I was in university in Ohio in the 60s, kind of in the height of the hippie counterculture, there was a law on the books in the city where I was attending college. And that law said that you could be arrested for suspicion of narcotic abuse if you took someone who was overdosed uh, to the emergency room of a hospital. Uh, that was pretty drastic. So it meant that you really couldn't help people. Uh, and in those days, there were plenty of teenagers and young people on the streets uh, who were runaways and who were uh, troubled and having real challenges in their lives. Uh, as a result, I got together with some medical students and some docs and started one of the first free clinics in the United States. And shortly after that, uh, a phone number, which was 321 CARE, C A R E, was one of the first suicide prevention hotlines. Um, that meant that I became uh, kind of intimately related to people who were looking at end of life uh, through suicide or who were just completely uh, bereft of uh, any reason to live, running away from their families, uh, often contracting illnesses and uh, just lost. Uh, the summer of 1969, uh, then I kind of inadvertently became a drug counselor because there was so much uh, drugs on the street of all those hippies and runaways. Um, and at one point in that summer, uh, I ended up at a fairly large gathering of people um, on uh, Yasker's farm in a tent at Woodstock, uh, where I was a talk down counselor for people who were experiencing um, bad acid trips. Uh, so I had my kind of face-to-face -face experience of what it meant for people who were in some form of alternate reality uh, having dropped acid, even though it was apparently bad acid, um, looking at kind of what they were really experiencing. In the following spring uh, in May, there was a profoundly moving experience for anyone who remembers May of 1970, um, as uh, a certain number of deaths occurred on the campus of T Kent State University when the National Guard came out and shot uh, just killing uh, protesters uh, who were angry at the Vietnam War and the Americans' involvement in the war. As a result of all those events in my own changing lifestyle, I started to believe that there was definitely more to learn beyond the textbook perspectives about suicide and about mental health and emotions. And I now know that in a sense, I was really looking back and looking for myself then, because of all those things that were happening, they were kind of happening inside me and what was happening inside my own psyche. Eventually, I kind of got fed up with the United States and went to Denmark, where after living there for almost two years, um, I experienced a lot of alternate realities. I dropped a lot of acid, smoked a lot of hashish, took a lot of hallucinogens and kind of came face to face with this world, much of which uh, Nario came to very differently, uh, the world of duality, the world
world of self, the world of uh, fiction, and realizing especially that we don't really grow up, we kind of grow down, right? which is that this force kind of extends our legs down into the earth and that much of why we're here has to be more horizontal in nature than vertical in nature. We have relationships on this plane rather than kind of energetic relationships between heaven and earth, shall we say. While I was there, uh, I weighed probably 80 pounds more than I did now, or I do now, and on a diet of kind of old pastries and uh, from the back of a Danish bakery uh, and a lot of hashish and drugs, I eventually had renal failure, collapsed on the street, uh, was taken by an ambulance to a hospital and told I needed to go on dialysis to save my life. That didn't seem like something I really wanted to do, uh, to kind of have a dialysis machine as my best friend for the rest of my life. Um, so against medical orders, about two hours before I was to go on my first dialysis uh, treatment, uh, I left the hospital. Uh, I walked out myself down a set of stairs to a friend of mine uh, who was waiting in the parking lot behind the hospital in a VW bus and off we sped uh, into, the, into the early morning really. Uh, he took me to a friend of his who was an acupuncturist, a Chinese man who put needles in my body and the third needle he put in, uh, I died on the mat, which was to say that I experienced my body leaving uh, itself, right? And who I am, who I was at the time, was watching what was happening below. Uh, I could see the acupuncturist trying to figure out what had just happened. Uh, he pounded the chest of this body that was there. Uh, and then just in a blink, uh, I felt myself going back into the body. But while I was in that space, I had this experience of something which uh, I'm going to refer to a little bit uh, later in this uh, presentation by a simple word. The word is luminosity. Uh, it is more than just light. It is a light much bigger than the light which might, uh, might light up a room or light up uh, a stage or light up uh, the outside of one's home or light up a football field. It's an all encompassing sense of uh, enlightenment, shall we say, but luminosity is something that often is experienced right as a person leaves their body. What the acupuncturist uh, who brought me back to life on the mat told me were three things. He said, number one, stop eating sugar. It's poison to you. Number two, don't take drugs ever again. Your body can't handle them anymore. And number three, he said, eat like Birta tells you to eat. It turned out that Birta was a student of Georgia Sawa living in Copenhagen at the time. So I began to study macrobiotics. I followed those first two uh, dictates very carefully for decades, not eating sugar and not taking any drugs. Uh, and I began to study with those students of Georgia Sawa living in Copenhagen. This was the early 1970s. And I soon after a couple of years returned to the US. I had changed so much that my mother actually walked by me in the airport when I came home. I was already macrobiotic. And since then I found a group of like-minded friends in a household in an intentional community in Ohio where they, like I embraced a kind of vegetarianism and macrobiotic principles. Not too long after that, still living in Ohio and working in emergency rooms and alcohol rehab programs, I was fortunate to land a job in Washington DC working with teenagers in a drug rehab center outside of DC in Arlington. And at that time, Michael and Gene Rossoff, uh, many of you know, uh, that's now Gene Sloan, but Michael Rossoff living in Asheville to this day. Uh, at that time, they had a macrobiotic center in DC. And that's when I eventually first met Micho and Abilene. Not long after that, 
couple of years in 1976, I would join my peers at what were the Mid-Atlantic Summer Conferences that some of you here might even have attended. They were organized by Murray Snyder and Denny Waxman, uh, old macrobiotic teachers, both of whom have passed. I often helped out in the kitchen at those conferences, as well as conducting a few of the counseling and massage sessions for people who attended. But I remember at that time, I was very eager and really pushy about what I knew. Uh, I recently saw a picture of myself uh, at those summer conferences, and there's Denny and Murray and Michael and Howard Waxman and many others, including my wife, Joan. Me standing proudly in the middle and the others, especially Denny and Murray, in the distance in a much more humble position. Eventually, Joan and I moved to Connecticut, where I worked at the Center for Living with Illness and Death at Yale. And soon thereafter, my wife and I opened our own East West Center. And at the same time, we opened something called the Nutrition Education Center and the Women's Resource Center in Middletown, Connecticut. And I mention those because these were pursuits of ours 47 years ago. Yet you might think that they're more recent uh, manifestations of people's interests. So we've been looking at these things for a pretty long time, trying to figure out questions around nutrition and the resources of women in birth and in life itself. At that time, I traveled to Boston often to hear lectures, uh, to be with my friends, but especially to see Micho and Aveline and other teachers uh, and I followed them into Europe and other places in the U.S. Some of them were my peers uh, who were with me because part of that journey became uh, with them the first faculty at the Cushy Institute in Boston in 1979. So a lot of people have no idea that there are those old first, first uh, frame of early macrobiotic teachers. I think the teachings at that time was really primarily around heaven's force and earth's force as much as anything else. And Micho was talking as much about the principles of macrobiotics as he was about food. Frankly, despite seeing many people facing life-threatening illness, I didn't really know all that much about death and dying until as a macrobiotic counselor in the early 1980s, I began to see men who came for consultation because of a skin disease. And many of them had this very severe, weakened immune system. In many cases, these men's bodies were covered with dozens of lesions, something called Kaposi's sarcoma. And some of the men also had pneumonias, uh, pneumocystis carini pneumonia, and an infection in their brains called toxoplasmosis or cytomegalovirus. These were some kind of infliction that altogether was called GRID, G-R-I-D, which stand, stood for gay-related immune deficiency. And it was not uncommon for the men I counseled to die only days or weeks after meeting them. And of course, this was eventually, eventually identified as human immunodeficiency virus or HIV or AIDS in 1981. At the same time, many macrobiotic counselors and teachers, particularly myself, uh, Danny Waxman, Shizuko Yamamoto, Murray Snyder, together with Dr. Martha Cottrell, who was then working at FIT, which is the Fashion Institute of Technology, helped many of those men and their friends through support groups in New York. This again was a kind of horizontal experience. That is that the support of people, person to person, peer to peer on the plane of the earth. And so to balance it, I really needed to kind of return to the vertical, that straight line of our spinal column. And so my own reflection and deep meditation sitting, not just for 10 minutes, but often for a half hour, 40 minutes, was really helpful for me to be able to return to those kind of horizontal exchanges that I had in consultation. 
I observed a lot of consultations with Micho conducted, many of them in New York City and in Boston and elsewhere. One time a man came into a consultation and he had obviously seen Micho before. He'd probably been three or four times before with a degenerative disease, which was obviously affecting his colon, his digestion. And Micho asked him many questions about what his practice was. Was he eating too much salt? How much rice was he eating? What kind of oil was he using? Was he doing the compresses? And to all of those questions, as this ashen gray faced man leaned in and listened carefully to Micho's questions, all of those questions were answered satisfactorily. So Micho couldn't recommend anything further because it appeared as if he was really following Micho's recommendations precisely. And then Micho leaned back and he said something that I'll never forget. And as he did, it turned out, I was looking at the man rather than at Micho. Micho said, kindly seek medical advice. The man just lost all of his life force. It just went right out of his body. He just looked dead. What I realized when I looked at Micho was he could have said something different, perhaps, but really not. He wanted to say, I'm sorry, I can't help you, but I have to tell you to go back to a doctor. He maybe wanted to say, please come home with me to Bucky Road and I will help you at the end of your life, but he couldn't. He wanted to say, there's so much I want to tell you now, but my lawyers have cautioned me against it, but he didn't. He just said, kindly seek medical advice. I'm sorry. I couldn't bear to issue such a directive because I came to learn that often that suggestion, that statement would mean to people who practice macrobiotics up until that point, that they would go back to their doctors who would in horror realize what they had been doing, eating macrobiotically and not caring for themselves having perhaps uh, gone away from Western care. And often they were then pumped full of chemicals, hospitalized, and very unfortunately die very uncomfortably surrounded, struggling in a traumatic way. So I began to look at that time into the field of palliative care, into hospice and into the many books on the end of life. I certainly didn't know anything about death and dying by this time, my own experience on the mat in Copenhagen was something that led me more to a study of life and living. Nonetheless, I had to better understand what many of the patients who had that disease that I saw in the 80s, GRID or AIDS, were facing. So I dove into that research. Some of those men, I came to realize, were passionately devout Christians some of them were observant Jews, and a few of them were Muslim. Nearly all of them were gay, and eventually I'd counsel women who contracted AIDS as well. Some of them died in my arms as I remained, completely unafraid of being infected. I held them or sat with them by their bedside or even climbing into bed with them, holding them and breathing with them at the end of their life. Donna, I heard, described some of that breathing, but a little bit uh, from now, I'm going to talk a little bit about that breath that happens at the end of life in a different way than uh, simply explaining what the books say and go through a little exercise that we can all experience. But for now, I thought for the benefit of the various traditions that people who are seeing this presentation might practice, and in reflection of those men and women with AIDS, I just want to insert here a brief overview of the perspectives of Christianity, of Judaism, of Buddhism, Islam, and even Hinduism on the subject of death and the end of life. In Christianity, death is viewed as a transition, uh, sorry, transition from earthly life 
to eternal life, as surely most people know. Christians believe in the resurrection of the dead and judgment by God. So the Bible teaches that those who have faith in Jesus Christ will be granted eternal life, while those who do not will face some kind of eternal punishment. This is a reflection in the distinction between heaven and hell. But more like Mari, uh, uh, Norio said, the arrow leaves the bow and ends up in the target. Whether that's heaven or hell, we don't know. Christians, like most other religions, more likely stress the importance of caring for the dying and honoring the dead. So we see services, mass, and rituals at the gravesides and in burials. And the Bible provides guidance on all those practices in Christianity. In Judaism, death is seen as a natural part of the cycle of life. And there's a strong emphasis on the importance of respect for the deceased. Jewish tradition teaches that something called the soul continues to exist after death. And that may be who we really are and that the body that we leave should be buried as soon as possible after death. Jewish funeral customs include washing and dressing the body, reciting various prayers, and burying the body in a simple wooden casket. And what follows are many days of sitting shiva, as it is called, to provide a time for mourners and family to come together for spiritual and emotional healing. This is not unlike a wake that might occur after a Christian passing. For Buddhists, death is viewed more as a natural part of an ongoing cycle of birth, life, and rebirth. And as for past lives, well, we're not so sure. I think there's a lot of new age mischief because of past life regressions and courses that people are teaching it's not uncommon to run into a number of people who were Cleopatra at uh, their last life. Or once I actually ran into a guy who said that he was Confucius, uh, which is, of course, nonsense because I was Confucius in my past life. So Norio was probably the guy who invented the wheel in that cave. So naturally, he loves wheels in this life. We don't really know much about the what happened in our past life, although some tolkus, some Buddhists, do have a sense of what last life was about. And as we see in the choosing of the Dalai Lama, it's clear that people have memories of their past lives as well. Buddhists believe in the concept of karma, which means that one's actions in this life will determine our future rebirths into the next life. But the ultimate goal of Buddhism is to achieve enlightenment and escape the cycle of rebirth. Buddhists' funeral customs vary depending on the tradition, but often involve cremation and the chanting of prayers to help the spirit or the soul of the deceased person pass through a transitory stage, which they call the bardo. In Islam, Death is also viewed as a transi transition from one state of being to another. Muslims believe in the concept of the afterlife, not unlike Christians, and that the soul will be judged by God based on their deeds in life, not unlike Buddhists. Islamic funeral customs include washing and shrouding the body, performing funeral prayers and burying the body as soon as possible after death. And finally, respecting one's last religious beliefs and practices in Hinduism, death is seen as a natural part of the cycle of birth, life, and rebirth. Again, quite similar to Buddhist traditions, Hindus also believe in the concept of karma and with the ultimate goal of achieving liberation from the cycle of rebirth through various spiritual practices. Hindu funeral customs vary depending on the tradition, but often involve cremation and other prayers to guide the soul on its journey. So please know that those are just brief overviews and each religion has a very rich and complex tradition of beliefs and practices related to death and the end of life. But as we can all see, there are so 
many obvious similarities between what on the surface might appear to be seen as disparate religions, but in many ways, they reflect the similarities of the core teachings in life of nearly all religious practices. And those mean kindness and service to others and compassion doing for others in this life inherent in most of the world's religious traditions around life itself. I saw macrobiotics as a way of embracing lifestyle choices for people facing the end of life diagnosis. For me, uh, as I worked at the Center for Living with Illness and Dying at Yale, I met Bernie Siegel in 77, 78. At the time, he was kind of a crusty old surgeon long before he wrote um, Life and Miracles, his book. Um, he used to say that the only use of the word terminal was at airports or when talking about batteries. Truth be told, counseling cancer patients was mostly a failure for most macrobiotic consultants. And as much as we knew, we really failed for a lot of understandable reasons. Sure, there are dozens of successes and many miraculous cures, but undoubtedly, and to be honest, there are likely 10 times more patients who couldn't heal themselves adopting a macrobiotic diet than those who we read about who did. But certainly even then, eating macrobiotically toward the end of life makes that transition all the more easy. Still, I really needed to learn about helping people die. After hearing Micho's statement that time and seeing the man's face, I sought out the real icon in the field Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, so I called her up. Elizabeth wrote 27 books on end-of-life care, and she was by far the most prominent teacher in the field of palliative care and of end-of-life. So as a macrobiotic teacher, I called her up and told her that I needed to understand how to help people die, not just help people live. During the conversation, I told her that I was a teacher and that I was teaching macrobiotics. And as a teacher, it was important for me to teach. I think I said the word teacher about 25 times, just so she was clear that I wasn't just an ordinary student. I mean, I was a teacher, so I was a very important person. And at the end of my conversation, she just laughed and said, come take my workshop. The first time I saw Elizabeth in a workshop, uh, she had a t-shirt on that said, I'm not okay, and you're not okay, and that's okay. <laughs> For two years, during which time I was not very active in the macrobiotic community, I immersed myself in those studies, and really, it became much more about my own self-reflection called Life, Death, and Transition really about how incredibly egotistical I was, how I feared death itself, even though I'd had that experience on the mat, how much my ego led and my identity of self led my life, right? Until I kind of emptied myself and could practice death and dying in a way by the bedside uh, that would really be of service. In other words, life, death and transition workshops with Elizabeth Cooper Ross wasn't just about gathering skill set for working at the end of life, but of really emptying oneself to be present and to contain that experience of other people and to be a deep place of listening for those who are passing from this world. One day, not long after I completed my training in the mid 80s, I ran into Micho and Aveline in a coffee shop in Switzerland. We were in Cantal at the Macrobiotic Institute there at the same time. They immediately said, oh, where have you been? What's going on? And I told them a little bit about my training with Elizabeth and my work, uh, which had just begun with Sogil Rinpoche as well in New York City, the teacher of uh, the Tibetan culture. Aveline listened very carefully and she shook her head and uh, said, yes, a very interesting. Oh, very good, very good. And then I turned to Micho and told him a little more of what I experienced. And Micho then looked at me kind of sternly and said, we are doing the same thing at Beckett. <laughs> and this simply wasn't true. 
uh, at Beckett, they may have been practicing meditation and chanting the Heart Sutra, but they weren't really working through the world of unfinished business and emotions and going through the processes that I'd been through with Elizabeth and other teachers in the life, death and transition workshops, nor with the hospice training that I eventually went through and began to be a teacher in. So at that time, I began to offer something called the General Passage, which was a five day retreat, primarily intended for hospice workers and primary caregivers, what the men and women in the AIDS community used to call significant others but it soon became apparent that individuals facing their own mortality came with their own caregivers, their children, or even with their doctors. So the general passage turned out not to be so gentle after all, because people faced their deep fears and unfinished business long before any diagnosis or problem came. So together with co-facilitators, uh, Ellen Goldsmith, Claudia Kirchmeier, Lucia Valente and others, we offered passages in Ireland, in England, in Italy, in Portugal, Croatia, Switzerland, Australia, all over the East Coast and West Coast at Vega. And because I had a platform at the Macrobiotic Summer Conferences, I offered an abbreviated version of those retreats focused on the emotional aspects of life, which many people attended, some of you who are here. I even remember Mark Van Cowenberg once came up to me afterwards and told me, that I was the first person in the Macrobot community that caused him to look deeply at his life and it brought him to tears. The fourth day of those five day full immersion retreats included some teachings about how to people, uh, how to be with people who were dying. Uh, skills and experiences I'd gained after time with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and with my Buddhist teacher, Sogyal Rinpoche, who was the author of the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying. And eventually I developed a follow-up course for those who completed the passage given at Upaya, uh, which I gave uh, with the help of Roshi Joan Halifax, a course called Open Heart, Deep Spirit. And that was an even more in-depth weekend of exploration and learning about palliative care. At that time, I also had begun to teach feng shui, which was originally a discipline to honor the ancestral generation's placement of a marker for a tombstone or burial place, which later became more about the living. The original teacher of feng shui, and for that matter, the person who had manifested the I Ching, was said to be a gentleman who was a legendary emperor of China called Fu He. Even this early manifestor of the I Ching stayed mysterious. So I asked many, many teachers of Buddhism, of the I Ching and of Feng Shui, who was Fu He? How did he get there? Where did he come from? No one could answer. So I tried to find Fu He in my own meditation practice. And now I want to introduce you to kind of who Fu He was, the original man in Chinese culture, the first kind of Buddhist teacher, the guy who created the I Ching, shall we say, who created feng shui, right? Who was Fu He? So I'm gonna ask you to sit in a way uh, which is something like a meditative practice, right? Sit up straight and kind of quietly imagine that you're going to be in the beginning and the end of your life. So what did you look like at the beginning of your life? Your lips were pursed, your mouth was kind of puckered, much like a fish, and your first breath was out, right? So just breathe out through that breath with a pursed. And then at the end of your life, hopefully you will be full of luminosity, and you, like a Buddha, will smile, and then you'll inhale as your last breath. So smile and inhale through your mouth. And now blow out through the first breath in the beginning of your life with pursed lips. And smile, last breath. 
and blow out. In the beginning was the word blow, first lips. There goes your life at the end of your life. Smile, last breath. First breath, in the beginning was the word. Smile, last breath. And the word was with God. First breath, breathe out. And the word was God. Who he was the name of God. Just like it says in the Bible, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. And in fact, our first breath is out and our last breath is in. Some people think our last breath is out, but that's more Hollywood. And that's more like the collapsing of an accordion. So you can open your eyes and see that after we take our last breath, and that breathing, which Donna explained in the concept of, looks like. <sighs> and then we leave our body. And then the accordion collapses. <sighs> but we're already out of our body, connected with a thread, what was called the cord, but it is a silver thread of light. And what is that just like? Well, you were in a placenta when you were formed in your mother's womb. And when you left the placenta, that body into which you were living and born and formed stays attached to you through your umbilical cord, a cord. And life pulses through that cord into your body until that pulsing finally stops and then the cord is cut. And just like in death, as in birth, the placenta then gets born and people have to figure out what to do with it. What do we do with the placenta? Should we bury it? Maybe we'll put it in a box and bury it. Or should we burn it? Maybe we'll just put it in the fire. Or should we take it to the mountaintop and chop it up as some cultures do so it can be eaten? Or should we serve it and eat it, as some cultures actually do? But eventually, that placenta is detached from the body which we live in. Just like at death, when we die, this body, our placenta, is attached to who we are through this cord, this silver thread, which pulses life and stays above until that pulse pulls away and then dissolves and thins and evaporates. One such teaching that I still find to be fascinating is the Buddhist belief that we're born with two drops of blood in our body, one from the mother's egg and one from the father's sperm. Of course, you know, if you see a fertile egg, you see there's a drop of blood in a fertile egg. There's also that drop of blood in a sperm, microscopic, submicroscopic. We can't even see it. Uh, I often say that, uh, ask, you know, why you think it takes a million sperm to fertilize just one egg. And that's because none of them will ask for directions. All of our thinking, though, is funneled through this one drop that we carry from our father from heaven's force downward. 
while all of Earth's matter's rising mean pattern is filtered through the drop received from our mother. These are the two drops of blood which form the anodes of a battery. That's what gives us the charge of heaven and Earth's force. That's our life's force, our fully charged battery. The drop at the top is located in our third eye. The one at the bottom is located in the hara. These two are like that battery, fully charged, and as they lose their life force, they're being used up like a battery, slowly weakening. And that means their positional polarity diminishes. So the chakras don't just disappear, they slowly, slowly become less highly charged until eventually they move from the hara upward, from the third eye downward. They pass through the stomach above the hara. They pass through the throat below the third eye. And eventually those two opposite poles touch in the heart. An explosion takes place. And that's what happens at the moment of death. This is not a universal belief among all Buddhists, but rather it's often associated with the Buddhist tradition and described in various Tibetan Buddhist texts. As far as chakras go, the battery simply loses its charge. So there are a lot of texts and teachings from many different traditions, Native American, shamanic, Judaic, Buddhists, one such text is the Bardo Thodal, or from the Tibetan Book of the Dead. It's a text about the afterlife and how we go through a different uh, various experience, including the separation from the gross physical body as those drops of blood begin to lose their position of polarity at the ends of that battery. And eventually before they meet in the heart, ch heart chakra, and we dissolve into kind of a universe of light. Over the past 40 years, I've had the distinct sacred honor and privilege of being present at many, many deaths. So the teachings have a special meaning for me in practice. As a macropodic counselor, I wanted to be able to offer some guidance and support, not only in birth and throughout life, but also as we near its end. And in the moments of active dying. So there are stages or phases that occur as the body and mind undergo dissolution. They're different than the stages of the physical body losing its force than Donna explained in her talk. They're, sta they're called in Buddhist tradition, the five stages of death or the five stages of dissolution. And they are the dissolution of our senses uh, and as we've studied in macrobiotics, of course, this adheres to and aligns with the five elements. The stage of earth is one of solidification and in it, this earth energy dissolves and our body becomes heavy and immobile. So the person who's dying finds it more difficult to lift their arms or lift their legs. Their body simply becomes really solidified. The second stage is one of water or liquefaction that the Buddhists describe. And when that is the element of water dissolving, the body actually cools off and becomes kind of fluid. It moves from a solid state into a fluid state as if there's a kind of floating energy throughout. And with it, we begin to lose our control of water. We might drool, we might have a runny nose, we might lose bowel or urine uh, control. The third stage of life was related to fire uh, as we go away from our living and toward our dying moment. And in that stage, fire dissolves and the body starts to become hot and dry in order to try to stay alive involuntarily. Uh, and as such, our mouth dries out right? and our eyes start to become a burning even. We may feel some sense of heat rising in the body as the lower part of the body becomes cooler and heavy. 
The fourth stage of life, the Buddhists call the evaporation stage or the stage of air. And in this stage, the element of air dissolves and the body starts to become much lighter. And the top of the body starts to dissolve and expand. We feel this in our heart. Um, and as such, the mind dissolves, but we find it difficult to breathe. And the individual who's dying begins to go through that breathing process of gasping for air, but more upward in its shorter exhalation, <laughs> trying to get more air into the body. It's important to note that all of these stages aren't necessarily experienced in any linear fashion and that the process of dying can vary depending on a lot of the individual circumstances. In the Buddhist tradition, there's lots of different signs, the feeling of dullness of lethargy in the earth stage, the feeling of lots of perspiration in the water stage, the feeling of being dry and thirsty in the fire stage, the feeling of kind of the breath gasping in the air stage, and finally, this feeling of complete disillusion, right? In which we experience this luminosity. And this luminosity often occurs right before death occurs where someone might go, and we're actually seeing pure light and transcendence. This feeling of release from the physical body and all of worldly concerns. So, this umbilical cord, this silver thread, right? this whole experience of the umbilical course, there's so much written on books of end of life, especially for me was important. Books by Stephen Levine early who wrote Meetings at the Edge and uh, Gradual Awakening and eventually a book called Who Dies and Healing into Life and Death, both of which are really uh, wonderful. I sent a list to uh, Kinnat, uh, which she can post on the chat of books I thought would be helpful for people who want to ex uh, explore these things better uh, more deeply. But Stephen Levine, who was a contemporary of mine and uh, who wrote extensively about end of life, um, often talked about only one practice at the bedside of a dying person that we really need to know. And that is the Braille method. In other words, you simply are present and feeling your way, sensing, as Norio said, trusting your feelings and creating a deep place of listening because you're blind. Hands-on may not be appropriate uh, because some people might find that as being an offense or an invasion of their personal space. And also very helpful is the pamphlet called The Five Wishes. Uh, those are loving resources for others who might care for you as you first yourself face your own passing. Uh, it asks you to reflect on your end of life wishes, like what music you might want or how to handle friends who want to come see you or what to do with your body after you pass. Both my mother and father created five wishes. They filled out this form of advanced directives, but they're very different than the advanced directives you might give the doctor for do not resuscitate. Like what music do you want to play? My mother wanted uh, Rachmaninoff's second piano concerto. My father wanted Frank Sinatra. <laughs> what friends do you want to visit? Uh, my mother would say, well, I don't want Barbara to come see me. And we were very surprised because Barbara was one of her close friends. And then she said, well, I don't want her coming in to pray over me and reading me the Bible. So we had to tell Barbara when she came to see my mother to just go in without the Bible and just be with my mother and uh, be next to her. And so the five wishes are a beautiful pamphlet you can uh, Google. Lastly, I wanted to just mention that I'm often called by friends and friends of friends who ask for advice with someone who's dying uh, and someone in their circles passing, how can I help my mother or my grand good friend or my grandfather? And the simple, answer to that is this, have your experience. When your father is dying, have your experience of what it's like for you to lose your father. Don't have your father's experience or don't try to have 
your friend's experience because it's the only time in your life when your father will die or when your grandmother will pass or when this deep, deep, close friend of yours is dying. What is it like for you? So if that brings you to tears or if you're scared, have that experience and don't leave that experience. Uh, step away from it to be in the person's experience at all. Sylvia so Rinpoche said, uh, and someone that I studied with in depth and was able to work closely with him around people who are dying. Whatever you think death is, whatever you've read, whatever you were taught, whatever study you have engaged in, whatever practices you are undergoing, however you view death, that's not what death is. <laughs> because Sogo basically said, we don't know. So I am leaving a little bit of time for some questions or from some exchange and um, have enjoyed uh, sharing my own presentation and listening to Donna and of course of Norio and look forward to hearing others present in the few hours ahead. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So do we have any questions, comments, discussion? You can open up your microphones. You don't have to wait for me to allow you and Mike. Bill, how do you deal with the fears that people have when they're dying? What do you do? Uh, to acknowledge fear is to, uh, in a, said in another way, not deny someone their own feelings. In other words, when a child comes to you in the middle of the night and says, I'm scared, probably the stupidest thing for you to say is don't be scared. <laughs> because, a, because a child would, in an adult voice, respond to you, uh, but I'm already scared. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so it's too late to say, don't be scared. You can instead say, oh, that must be difficult. All right, I'm right here with you. Right. Uh, I'm here and, you know, you're safe. I feel you, I will be with you, you know, crawl into bed with me. Let me hold you, whatever you might say to a child when they express fear. Don't deny the fear or don't deny any emotion they may have. Right? And creating that deep place of listening is encouraging people to say just exactly what they want to say in any way, shape or form particularly to someone who's close to them. Right? Um, the conversations you might have with people at the end of life should be conversations that are meaningful and deep about life itself, not about the stock market or who won the baseball game or what the weather is. Right? Really, like, what was it like when you and daddy first met? You know, what was it like when I came home with my first boyfriend? What was it like when I went off to college? What, and, kind of what kinds of experiences they can look back on, good or bad, happy or sad, just so they can kind of come to terms with having lived a life and not kind of brushing that away on some meaningful mundane conversation about the latest uh, weather report or baseball score. Another another great great presentation, Bill. Thank you very much. Thank you, and, and uh, it goes very very well with uh, with the Norios uh, together like that for for us to consider. This is a very very heavy duty uh, a program that uh, Ginat's put together. You know, uh, for for me, it uh, the the piece of what. Norio uh, put forward, I, I will say that there's a kind of a distinction. Um, and that is that uh, I would consider myself ultimately to be a student more of his uh, father and of his father's teacher, George Sala, uh, in the following way. Um, Micho taught, and for me, I took away two teachings more than any. The first was play. That this is a game. 
this is play. You, that, that's what we get to do. That we shouldn't uh, give it up just because we somehow grew up at uh, age four, six, 10, 15, 27, whatever, that we continue to play. And we play on this earth, that the whole earth is our playground. And so much of what I've done in the disaster work is create play shops for kids around helping them to release stagnant emotions after impact of heavy traumas. <laughs> but the second thing that I learned from Micho after traveling so closely with him and asking him in kind of a happy moment of like, wow, this is all there is. You're just like, you're active and you eat well and what else? <laughs> And what he said to me was, one more thing, give it all away and make sure it's useful. And so there's a certain aspect of play, which is non-action, which is just being. And that's a kind of Taoist uh, energy, which I highly respect of people who just sit and be and things happen. Mm -hmm. But for me, I'm not a sit and being kind of guy. I'm a playing, doing, serving kind of guy. So my play is to make it useful to people and to give it away mm -hmm. and to make a difference in the world in that way of service. Because I believe that the tradition of life of my own religious teachings and my own spiritual practices compel me to be of service compel me to do something, compel me almost out of an obligation of making a difference in the world, not simply to sit, but to be active in the world. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not so content to simply go whatever happens right? mm -hmm. uh, and to rather play and give it away and make a difference. And, and th th that you, you figure comes from your background that, that uh, incentive? Well, you know, I didn't realize where it came from until my grandfather died, until, and he died at 91, having never been sick a day in his life. But it was nine years later on the occasion of his 100th birthday, when my mother sent me a eulogy that she and her sister wrote, I could not possibly have attended that because I was teaching in Switzerland at the time. But my six other first cousins, descendants of my grandfather, gathered uh, for my grandfather's 100th birthday. And I found out something I didn't know about my grandfather because they had kept it a secret his whole life. And that was very much in the spirit of Maimonides. He had quietly been enormously philanthropic. He had brought Jews from Germany to the United States, paid for their houses, helped their children get jobs, put their kids through colleges. He never told anyone about the things that he did in his lifetime and in their lifetime. He kept it quiet and he was enormously impactful in life. But as the highest level of the code of charity of Maimonides who became one of my great scholarly teachers, uh, he did it as a way of living. So. I realized that I kind of had that in my genetics. And when I looked at my mother's life, I realized, oh my God, she did the same thing. Right? And she never told anyone. And she came, uh, she used to call herself as a professional volunteer. <laughs> and she did an amazing things. Um, so I feel obliged and compelled to kind of make a difference and to do what I can, but not because I want the recognition. In fact, um, I do a lot so that I stay under the radar, <laughs> try to hide and turn down the invitations that Alec Jack and Sandy Pukel keep making to join the cruise or to attend the summer conference. I, thanks, I am doing something else right now. <laughs> and well, Godot will tell you, she asked me. I feel she asked me. you accepted my invitation. Thank you. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> she asked me many times and I know I'm not now, not this time, so. This, this subject, um, I thought I'd want to be a part of. No, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you, you clarified that, Bill, because it's, that's the way that it sounded to me. You know, the, the rectification of the universe is a formal doctrine. And uh, uh, under the title of uh, Tikkun, 
uh, Olan. That's and, right. And 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 that's that's how it sounded to me. You know, I've been uh, I've been blessed in that regard. You know, I've I've met. Uh, many of your contemporaries, you see, who are similarly uh, motivated, you see. So, so anyway, um, uh, and as you say, it, it's uh, uh, distinctive uh, 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 for you. Uh, at the same time, uh, Norio has has his side as well, and uh, you know, e equally uh, uh, incentivized, if you will, and uh, and so that's. That's why I say uh, uh, today's program with uh, Ginat is uh, uh, terrifically uh, heavy duty. So thanks again. Sure, thank you. And I also thank you, Bill. It's a real pleasure. It's a real honor to have you and I greatly appreciate it and you. Thank you. Thanks, Ginat. Ginat.